joining us. We have quite a number of people, over 200 already, who have joined this webinar. Um, my name is Lada Kiswani. I'm the Executive Director of the Arab Resource and Organizing Center in the San Francisco Bay Area. I am honored to be moderating this conversation um, in support of critical resistance. Today, you're going to be hearing from a series of organizers from across the country. We wanted to lift up the efforts um, of movement partners right now in this crisis, the ways in which campaigns, um, lo local and national, have been organizing um, towards abolition in particular um, during this pandemic. Um, specifically, you'll be hearing from people in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Chicago, and Sacramento, and Portland. Um, you'll be learning a lot about different abolitionist practices and campaigns and responses, some that you can actually draw on lessons for, hopefully for your own organizing and work that you're taking part in, um, and also to just reflect on how you can embed and weave in um, abolition in all the work that we are engaged in in this moment. Um, you'll also be learning about ways to support our communities, both on the inside and the outside. Um, so thinking and keeping in mind those who are in prisons at this moment, and as well as all those who are impacted by this pandemic on the outside. And lastly, of course, while we're also wanting to be able to draw on and contribute to a framework of internationalism and international solidarity. So while we're going to be hearing more specifically around United States-based campaigns, we want to also keep in mind um, a framework that keeps that remembers the ways in which we're seeing international solidarity flourish in this moment um, and other ways that countries across the world have actually embodied an abolitionist politic um, in specific examples being Iran releasing 85,000 prisoners. Um, the, the solidarity mutual aid we've seen between Cuba, Venezuela, China, and Italy. Um, and at this very same time, the way the United States continues to play a role in strengthening sanctions against Iran and Venezuela. All of that sort of as the, um, the context in which we're thinking about imprisonment, surveillance, policing, um, and mutual aid and solidarity. So thank you all for the wonderful um, organizers who agreed to be a part of this conversation to share about their work. Also want to appreciate all the supporters of Critical Resistance um, and the movements that are contributing to this work. Um, and please, as you're going to be hearing from these awesome organizations, if you feel inspired to contribute and donate to their campaigns and to their work, we'll be dropping in in the chat box links to be able to support them directly. We really encourage all kinds of mutual aid in this moment, including lifting up organizing and movement work. Um, so the way we're going to go about the conversation is you're going to hear directly from each of the organizers who have agreed to be part of this conversation for a few minutes. You'll be learning about the demands that they're making right now in their work, what kind of strategies and tactics they're employing, um, and also what kind of impacts they're seeing thus far. Um, and from there, we'll move into um, some question and answer, and there'll be some time for you all, the audience, to post some questions. We, you can chat them in the chat box, and we have Andrew from Critical Resistance who will be um, working that out for us all. So hopefully, um, this will be a useful conversation for everybody, and as well as a useful conversation for our movements at large. Um, so we're going to, the lineup will be, you'll see several people on the Zoom already, and so we have... Um, people will be discussing local jail campaigns, Amber Piat from Human Impact Partners and the Audit Sheriff Ahern campaign here in the Bay Area. We'll have Unesis Hernandez from Justice Los Angeles about de-incarceration in Los Angeles jails. We have folks from Decarcerate Sacramento, MK Orsalak and Liz Bloom. Um, and then we'll have Kyle Neal from Kuwav, um, Communities United Against Violence and the No New SF Jail Coalition. And Charlene Grace from the Chicago Community Bond Fund. Um, then we'll be hearing about broader imprisonment, state prisons um, focus, and then we'll have Amber Rose Howard from CURB, California United for a Responsible Budget. Um, we will have Laura Whitehorn joining us from Release Aging People in Prison, um, Andrea James from the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls in Boston, and then we'll be discussing decriminal, decriminalization, jails and policing with Anna So and Rory Elliott from Critical Resistance Portland chapter and Care Not Cops campaign in Portland. So hopefully you're all as excited as I am to hear from these wonderful organizers. And we're gonna go ahead and kick it off um, to hear from Amber Piat from the Human Impact Partners Audit Ahern campaign. Please go ahead, Amber. 
you. Can y'all hear me okay? Yeah, great. Okay. So yeah, thank you, Lana and, and Critical Resistance for holding and creating the space for us to learn together amidst these very challenging times. Um, as Lana mentioned, my name is Amber Akemi Pyatt, and I'm the director of the Health Instead of Punishment program at Human Impact Partners, or HIP, and we are part of the Audit Ahern Coalition. So right now we have two parallel tracks of advocacy happening in Alameda County, California, which is where Oakland is. So first, as we became more and more aware of the very real threat of COVID-19, a group of us huddled to talk about what we needed to do to protect the health and safety of people inside our local jail, which is called Santa Rita. And we decided to submit a letter of demands to our local officials, which outlines four buckets of demands. So first, that they stop the flow of people into Santa Rita Jail. Two, that they release everybody, and we stated everybody, from Santa Rita Jail, starting with those who are most vulnerable to serious cases of COVID-19, if infected. Third, that they must meet the immediate needs of people who are still inside Santa Rita Jail while we actively decarcerate. And then fourth, that we actually invest in the things that make us healthy, like housing and healthcare. So we submitted that letter about two weeks ago by email. And then about a week ago, we found out that our local sheriff, Gregory Ahern, had filed a last minute request for an additional $85 million annually to our Board of Supervisors to increase staffing at his jail. So this budget request was not only a surprise to us, but also to the staff inside of the county building. And Sheriff Ahern has actually since admitted in an on the record meeting that his budget proposal was done without any real staffing analysis and without accounting for contextual trends like recent decarceration successes. So this, of course, is particularly egregious given that so many of our frontline healthcare workers, our unhoused neighbors, undocumented families, and low-income communities desperately need more resources right now due to the pandemic. So at this point, we are having to run on both tracks, our letter of demands for full decarceration in the jail, as well as fighting this opportunistic money grab. And so to do this, as far as strategies and tactics, we've been working this from all angles, including doing call-in campaigns, getting the issue highlighted in local media, um, creating a video about the issue with a local filmmaker, getting labor unions to endorse our demands, and meeting with officials directly, including the sheriff and district attorney themselves. And one just more creative strategy um, that we employed in the tactic was that the morning of the Board of Supervisors meeting, where they were set to vote on the sheriff's money grab, a group of unidentified activists also hosted a car protest where despite shelter in place orders, they parked in separate cars, so they were physically distancing, um, outside of the county administration building with signs and honked and blasted music to disrupt the meeting. And that item actually got pulled um, from the vote that day and will be voted on tomorrow, which means if you live or work in Alameda County, we need you to call board president Baye and your supervisor and tell them to vote no on the budget ask and invest in healthcare, not handcuffs. I'll put more information in the chat after um, I give my brief update and you'll get more information in the follow-up email as well. So in closing, you know, the outcomes we've seen so far are the latest numbers I've seen are that we've gotten about 400 people released from Santa Rita jail. This was mostly done by resentencing people and granting early releases for people with only a short bit of time left to serve. And while we're really grateful that those folks are out, that is not nearly enough people getting released. So the struggle there continues. And, you know, we've also gotten the DA to commit to weekly meetings with us and gotten the sheriff to agree to give us updated numbers on the jail population every day. And so lastly, you know, it's always, always important that we amplify and are led by folks who are currently or formerly incarcerated in this work. So I wanna play 20 seconds of testimony from our comrade who is currently inside of Santa Rita Jail and I'll chat a transcription of what he's saying too since the audio is a little hard to hear. I'm coming around to you, 
chat um, what our comrade said and I just want to thank you all again and please feel free to chat any questions you all have for me in the chat function or email me at amber at humanimpact.org and I'm really excited to learn um, from my comrades and all the other places next. Thank you. Thank you so much Amber um, and that wonderful work that you're all doing locally. Next we're going to hear about another local campaign and organizing in Los Angeles. Unessis Hernandez is joining us from Justice LA. Thank you, Inessis. Thank you, Lara. Thank you everyone for hopping on the call this morning. It, it feels nice to just be in interaction and, and in space with folks. Uh, it's, you know, helping my mental health. So appreciate you all. And I hope everybody's stay, uh, staying safe and healthy. Um, the Justice LA Coalition, we, we started mobilizing around the COVID response uh, pretty early. Um, and so we have a list of demands that we've had and developed. But just to give you a framework of where we started, LA County average daily population jails was 17,000 every single day. 44% of those folks were pretrial. Uh, significant number of those folks are AB 109. And so since um, we've started our advocacy and pushing our demands around COVID, our jail population has decreased to 14,430, with it, which is like thousands of people released in literally a matter of weeks. We've seen that the sheriff has reduced bookings every day from 300 to 60, showing how arbitrary the system is and how unnecessary it is. We've also seen the weakest links in the system, such as the judges, who are the ones who are refusing to let people out, who are standing in the way of releasing as many people as possible here in LA County. Uh, so to respond, we created a, uh, we gave our group a, a name, it's called the JLA uh, COVID response team, and we put a couple of demands together, but what we started is that we sent letters to every level of government, starting from the city all the way up to the federal level, because we, folks were reaching out to us from the federal public defender, so we, we wanted to respond to the federal level. We also saw that people were still getting pushed into the courts and into the jails from local city folks, such as a city attorney and LAPD and others. And so we put letters uh, of demands together for each of those jurisdictions. Um, we also uh, created specific petitions around folks that we know we needed to push. So we have a, a, a petition uh, in LA County pushing the judges, uh, the top two judges in LA County, the presiding judge, as well as the one in charge of the criminal division, really pushing them and demanding them to not implement really messed up law policies that they're trying to do. Because in LA County, they're trying, well, and across the state, they're trying to make it instead of 48 hours for arraignment, it's seven days. And so really trying to push the judges to act better, respond better, um, which has been very difficult. I mean, we've seen that even in our pretrial work, they're like the wall that we were trying to break. So that's been, that they're one of our targets, but also, um, I'm sure that folks know, but there's like government and penal codes that have given like the sheriff and others unlimited discretion to literally release people. And so we're trying to empower our sheriff to release people, uh, also pushing him to release people. But we figured out that in LA County, there's a person who can push the sheriff to do it and tell him you have the right to do it, which is the LA County health officer. So we've identified that person to be Dr. Montu Davis here in LA County. So we've created a, a campaign targeting Dr. Montu Davis to really push and put a motion out uh, for him to have the power to look into the jails and see what is the status of the jails, how they're gonna react around COVID. And so I think um, what we've learned is that there's a lot more targets than we have normally expected, but because we're all you know at home organizing, it's been, able, it's been easier to create actual smaller campaigns to target all these people. And so we've seen that um, the Board of Supervisors has taken good steps in moving forward, but they're not holding system actors accountable like the sheriffs. They're not demanding that folks move forward. And so we um, also have a petition around LA County to take immediate steps to push other system actors to let people go. And so something that's been really, um, I think, powerful in our work is the work being done by Mark Anthony Johnson, uh, Mark Anthony Clayton Johnson, the executive director of Frontline Wellness Network, because he created a petition for folks who uh, 
healthcare workers who are working inside the jails and healthcare workers who are working in the hospitals and other healthcare clinicians and doctors to come together to sign a petition demanding that as many people be released as possible. We've been demanding that they do this in phases as well, like to get out the most vulnerable folks. One thing though that we're experiencing here in LA County is that yes, folks are being released, but we're hearing that folks are not being released because they don't have housing to come out to. And reentry programs are not taking people who are being released from the jails. And so one of our colleagues as well, Diana Zuniga, which I'm sure you all know, her cousin is stuck in a, a quarantine pod inside the LA County jails, and they won't release her cousin because he's in a quarantine pod, but also because they're not testing people to be released. And the reentry program, the mental health reentry program won't take them because he's, they're scared that he might have COVID but we don't know because no one's getting tested. Right now, I think it's been less than uh, 100 people who have actually been tested in the jails, no positive cases yet, but it's just gonna be a matter of time. And also the person who's in charge of the, like the, the county correctional health services, an LA Times article was quoted saying, well, we know what's gonna happen, but we have a plan for that, which they really don't because they don't even have anything to give people to clean themselves right now. There's no way to social distance inside the jails. Our jails have no outside. And so it, once it gets in, it, 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 it could be so detrimental to all the people in there, especially because over 30% of our folks have some sort of behavioral health need, whether it's mental health needs or substance use needs. So yeah, it's, it's a lot. We're trying to push the reentry system to accept folks, but because of the lack of testing, it's really a hindrance to getting people out of our jails. So we're trying to push the healthcare system to act um, but it's, it's not happening fast enough. Thank you so much, Unesis. Um, you know, the need to get people out of the prisons is obviously an important demand that we all should be lifting up and thinking about ways to integrate into our work. Next, we're going um, to have Liz Bloom from Decarcerate Sacramento. And I just wanna also remind everybody, this is being recorded. So you will get a recording of this webinar and a list of resources that have been named um, throughout the conversation. And if you pay attention to the chat box, there's also a number of resources that are being shared. So I'll go ahead and hear from Liz now. Hi everyone, I'm really happy to be on here with all of you. Um, yeah, so Sacramento County, um, similar to, you know, the folks that just um, spoke, we uh, released our demand letter about two, two and a half weeks ago. Um, we included demands like suspending arrests, um, immediately identifying medically vulnerable people, um, releasing all those with, with misdemeanors. Ultimately, we want everyone um, released. Um, and, but our demands were very specific um, in hopes that we could um, push for the release of, of uh, the most vulnerable people first. Um, simultaneously to our uh, demands letter being released, we actually um, were, uh, were working with the public defender's office and realized they were already planning on filing a motion. So working with them to um, um, file uh, motions to pressure the courts to release, um, to pressure, the, to have the courts order the sheriff to release people. Um, so, so far, um, 490 people have been um, um, ordered to be released, and we're unsure exactly how many have been released so far, but we've been out in front of the jail since um, those motions have been filed um, with anti-police terror project Sacramento um, providing jail support. Um, we've raised funds and recruited volunteers and we're really trying to provide support for those who are being released while we're wearing N95 masks and gloves. Um, we've primarily been trying to coordinate legal efforts with um, not only the public defender's office but federal um, not only the county public defender's office, but also federal public defenders and other attorneys. And that was led by Tiffany, who unfortunately is sick today and couldn't be on the call. Um, but coordinating those efforts in hopes that we can, um, all, so that the legal efforts happening in the county can be um, leveraged in, in um, coordinated ways. Um, so we've been, one of the ways that, um, 
that attorneys have been leveraging community is, of course, with our, our sign on letter has been collecting, we've collected over 200 signatures from community members and community organizations. But also what was really powerful is a, um, a letter from medical professionals um, written by, by doctors and signed on by over 100 um, medical providers in the county. And so that was really powerful. Our public defender contact said that that was like something that really helped push along these um, motions that she's been filing. Um, uh, let's see, I also wanted to mention budget advocacy. So we, um, the, the sheriff <laughs> hasn't, you know, similar to Alameda County, hasn't necessarily put in a specific ask, but our sheriff's budget is increased every single year. We've, um, um, every you know we've been pushing for a long time now to to shift that budget as i'm sure all of you have um but ultimately you know it's we've been trying to balance this covid response with budget advocacy which is proving to be a little bit difficult but we did do um a call and email campaign to pressure like now more than ever of course we need the county to shift funding um from the sheriff's department, which gets the majority of our funds um, to things that actually help people. Um, so, so we've been, you know, sort of similar to Alameda, we've been sort of pushing for that. And of course we have till June till those final decisions are made. Um, yeah, another, another thing that is um, sort of a challenge I wanted to highlight that has been, um, uh, happening in our county before COVID, but also is, I think, um, uh, almost exacerbated with COVID is we, of course, want people out by any means necessary. Um, we want everyone out of there, but um, so this SB 10 PSA pretrial program has been launched in Sacramento County. Um, it's the, to replace cash bail, which actually puts people on formal probation and including search and seizure um, before trial, before they're convicted of anything. And so Unfortunately, that's happening more now. Pre-trial, people are being put on formal probation, which is concerning, but it's, you know, the public defender's office is balancing, like, do we want people out or do we want people on probation? So, um, unfortunately, right now, I mean, the challenge for us is, like, like um, we're trying to simultaneously advocate for people to be released, but also, you know, we see people when they're released from the jail with these letters to um, that they, they've agreed to turn themselves in, or they were required to turn in themselves in, in 60 to 90 days, either doing the sheriff's work program, slave labor, or being turned back into the jail. And so um, we have a lot more work to do <laughs> um, advocating for just the, the flat out release of these people and not any stipulations attached to this, um, in, whether that's probation or, or turning themselves in after. Um, most recently, 16, uh, uh, over 1,650 petitions have been filed in total. Um, that's the total number of people that um, would be released if the motions are agreed to. Unfortunately, judges have been a huge barrier for us, similar to LA, um, and the judges want the DA to agree. And so unfortunately, it's like this, um, this negotiating <laughs> uh, between the, the PD in the, in the DA's office. Um, and unfortunately in our county, you know, even the public health director and the medical director of the jail aren't even on the same side as the public defender's office. And so really it's like a decarcerate Sacramento anti-police terror project and the public defender's office really trying to put um, as many um, pressures as possible on the county to release folks. And um, yeah, we've got a lot more work to do. Thanks, Liz. It's, it's inspiring to see a lot of the similar demands across counties and uh, across states and ways in which we're learning from each other's tactics. Um, next, we're going to hear from Kyle Neal from KUAV, Communities United Against Violence, also the known USF Jail Coalition. Uh, hi, folks. This is Kyle with KUAV, Community United Against Violence, um, and we're also a partner organization of the known San Francisco um, Jail Coalition. Um, and so also just really appreciating to hear all of the like demands um, and like strategies that people are using because I feel like that is definitely going to be something that we're going to be able to also um, incorporate within our um, work that we are doing. Um, and I think that one of the things in particular that we have been 
um, just in providing some context. So in um, San Francisco, um, about a month ago, the jail population was around 1,100 folks. Um, and as of Friday, we were just under 900. So there have been about 200 folks that um, have been released um, since um, everything has been happening. Um, and about a week and a half ago, um, we also issued out a set of demands um, similarly to um, the folks um, that are doing work around um, Ada Ahern and um, the Santa Rita Jail. So um, in making sure that like folks are not getting arrested, um, getting as many folks released as possible, particularly starting with like most vulnerable communities of like trans, gender non-conforming and intersex folks, um, the youth, elderly, um, folks with medical conditions, um, and then also making sure to really prioritize, like making sure that once folks actually end up getting released, um, they actually have access to housing, they have access to like reentry support services, uh, medical and mental health resources and food um, access. Um, and so I'd say that that has sort of been one of the things that we have really struggled with um, in particular, um, because um, similarly to like what also has been happening in LA and um, Sacramento, um, the courts have like also wanted to release folks, um, but then there hasn't actually been adequate housing for folks to be released. Um, and so I would say that that has been one of the really big things that we've been um, also sort of simultaneously pushing is trying to like meet with like key um, stakeholders in order to really push for uh, making sure that folks can have access to like hotels, um, at least in like the short interim until we can like figure out the longer term strategy of like, how do we actually make sure that folks have access to housing. Um, and I would also just say that one of the other sort of big things that our coalition has been really focused in on has been um, shutting down 850, which is one of the, the three jails within San Francisco that are still open. Um, and over the last several months, we've been really working on um, drafting legislation, well, over the last several years, but within the last several months, we've been able to like identify um, a supervisor who's actually been um, working with us to draft legislation um, in order to close down 850. Um, and last week, um, we did an interview and sort of press release um, saying that we have an intention to close down 850. Um, and we're actually gonna be introducing legislation um, next week that will um, effectively close down 850 with um, no out of county transfers, with um, trying to keep the bed population, um, the bed count at the sort of federal, the state recognized um, level, as well as um, no increases in electronic monitoring. Um, and so I think one of the things that we've really been um, trying to do is uh, make sure that we are um, increasing pressure to close down 850 um, and get folks out as quickly as possible while also trying to make sure that um, folks are actually being released um, and actually being able to be cared for um, while all of this is happening. Um, and I think the other thing that um, we have also sort of just been noticing is that with folks that have been getting released, there's been um, an increase in the number of electronic monitoring um, for folks that are being released. And so that is one of the things that um, our coalition is, is opposed to. Um, and one of the challenges that we have been noticing, especially with like the increase in policing that has been happening is like folks that are on EMs are still getting arrested. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that we're really strategizing around how to um, also shift that as a dynamic. Um, and then since we're going to be having legislation dropping um, in about a week, um, I would say that the other sort of way in which folks can get involved is we're going to be doing some sort of um, call in action. We're continuing to really strategize around that, um, but in really pressuring the supervisors, um, to make sure that they are legislating that 850 gets closed down, but also making sure that we actually have the resources for folks um, getting out as, as much as possible. Um, and so, um, yeah, if you all are San Francisco based, um, please make sure to sign on um, and call in, email supervisors. Um, and also we should be doing some Twitter stuff. Um, so it'll be a Twitter storm as well. Thanks so much, Kyle. I want to just lift up what a great victory it is that we are getting people released from, 
from prisons. And so really awesome work of the grassroots organizations doing that um, to make that possible. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Charlene Grace from the Chicago Community Bond Fund. Hi everyone, it's great to be here, to be learning from all of your incredible organizing around the country. Um, for context, in Cook County Jail, we do have one of the largest single site jails in the country. Um, for the last year, there have been around 5,500 or 5,600 people in jail on any given day, 90% people awaiting trial, and another 2,400, 22 to 2,400 people on electronic monitoring all awaiting trial. Um, we do have COVID-19 cases in the jail already as we do in the city. So one week ago today, last Monday, there was one positive test among incarcerated people, several positive tests among um, guards. And today, the numbers from last night were that there were 101 incarcerated people who had tested positive for COVID-19. So of course, what we're seeing is exactly what we all knew would happen, exactly what's happening in Rikers, right? This exponential rise um, within the jail because of the impossibility of social distancing. Um, so I don't want to repeat stuff in terms of demands that others have put out already. CCBF put out our first statement about COVID-19 and a demand for release from people of people in the jail on March 6th. Um, so we're well over three weeks and trying to pressure local electeds. Um, we have we put out an open letter to county electeds that now has more than 100 organizational signers on March 13th. So um, someone just shared that in the chat. Thank you so much. A lot of the demands are the same. Um, we definitely benefited from the demands and um, recommendations of the National Bail Fund Network that we're part of. And so while those were geared towards community bail funds, those are good demands for jails, I think, good example demands. Um, we'll also make sure that that's shared in the chat. Um, with the open letter, what we've been doing to follow up was a call-in campaign. It started out one day, and then with lack of sufficient movement, we've been continuing it basically all of last week, All and having the organizational signers also share with their memberships and targeting primarily the sheriff, the state's attorney's office, and the chief judge here. Um, we have been in contact from the beginning with <clears throat> the public defender's office and then some other nonprofits that do criminal defense. Um, and so one of the things we started doing right away that I've heard other people saying you're doing is sharing template motions that individuals can use to get people out. Um, and then also when people contact us as a bail fund for help also sharing that back out, especially when it's a circumstance when we can't help by paying bail, but also because paying bonds is always going to be so limited in terms of the scale of people that we can free that way compared to the system change and the release capacity that judges and other stakeholders have if they were, are willing to do that. Um, so we worked, we very quickly saw the limits in the individual reviews. Um, and we worked with the public defender's office, pressured the public defender's office, I should really say, to file a novel petition for mass release, trying to get people released in big categories, big chunks of people released, instead of just doing individual reviews for the thousands of people. Um, and what we really saw was the county patting themselves on the back for releasing a few dozen people, when what we know the scale needs to be is releasing thousands of people. Um, we did a socially distanced prayer vigil with some faith leaders outside the jail um, on the morning that that um, hearing was happening in the public defender's motion and got some really good press coverage of that um, to try to continue to draw attention on it. Everything we're doing, we're also trying to leverage press around. Um, we also did last week a bailout action with Believers Bailout and with RFK Human Rights and paid $120,000 to get 20 people out. Again, 20 people, we know there are thousands of people, everyone in our jail should be released. Um, so really focusing on the framework of that of, yes, it's urgent, yes, we have to get all the individuals out we can, any way that we can, but bail funds are not going to be the solution, we're not adequate, we're only taking this action because of the failure of leadership from our electeds um, and really trying to drive that home. Right now we're looking into potentially federal litigation around conditions and particularly the impossibility of maintaining safety for incarcerated people given the exponential rise of cases inside and what we know about the limited capacity of the healthcare system. 
Um, I'm trying to think. We're also supporting statewide partners um, that we have been working with in our campaign to end money bail at the state level and end pretrial incarceration. To We drafted a template letter that they can send to their local county electeds. Um, we've been working with the non-CO unions, so unions that represent staff in the jail other than the guards. So in particular, National Nurses United um, represent some of the nurses in the hospital or the health center inside the jail, and then also an SEIU local that represents some therapy and admin staff and also non-nurse healthcare workers. Um, and I think the other thing I'd say is that we have some specific demands that we've been making around electronic monitoring. I don't know if James Kilgore is still able to join or not to talk about that, but one thing is that our pretrial electronic monitoring with there being 2,400 people on it per day is huge. Um, and the default position for everyone subject to that is 24 seven house arrest. So demanding that people be given movement um, from the sheriff's office that the judiciary issue directives um, like someone else said earlier, we've really identified the unwillingness of judges to revisit their decisions and release more people as a stopgap. We've worked with partners to send a separate letter to the Illinois Supreme Court demanding that they issue guidance um, to judges who are being very cowardly in this moment. Um, and the other thing I'd say is we're really trying to push back against the same racist logics around punishment um, that are now coming out in the guise of like public health, right? So people saying, well, it's already in the jail, so we can't release people until everyone's tested. Well, it's also in the community. We need to, we shouldn't delay getting people out of this deadly situation when we know that there's a lack of tests, right? People who are incarcerated need to be given the same opportunity to quarantine and stay at home as those of us who have likely been exposed or are known to have been exposed in the community, right? So I see this sort of um, almost concern trolling also, like throwing up barriers to release. Um, and especially, I think this isn't from organizers where we're all always trying to demand housing and access to other resources for our people to keep everyone safe. But I think from electeds who didn't give a shit about whether or not people had housing before they were criminalized and caged to then be like we have to keep these people in cages because they don't have housing that we need to call out the hypocrisy of that and we need to both demand resources for housing and we need to say absolutely not before this crisis your institutions were releasing people without ids without money without anywhere to go consistently all the time to also reject the idea that people can be quarantined inside and to say that what we know that that is a form of solitary, that it's torturous, that it's punishment, um, and that um, any suggestions that people be quarantined inside amount to punishing people. Um, and so rejecting, rejecting special targeted treatment for people who are incarcerated that keeps them incarcerated um, and demanding that they have the same access to healthcare and supports that people have on the outside. Thank you so much. Um, you raised a lot of really important intersections around healthcare, housing justice, surveillance, um, and imprisonment, all important topics that we will, um, I'm sure, intersect with all of our work and what all the organizing you all are doing. We're going to zoom out a bit and now move into state level, statewide work, um, and the ways in which efforts have been made there, both in terms of releasing prisoners, but also dealing with the immediate needs of people. Um, and also would want to lift up that um, one example in Palestine right now, there's been four political prisoners who have um, now have been have COVID and are not being released in the Palestinian Prisoners Commission and Al-Damir, the Palestinian Solidarity Organization has made demands to release them as well. So also learning across borders around solidarity efforts to support all kinds of prisoners. Um, we're first going to hear from Amber Rose Howard from California's United for a Responsible Budget on the work they're doing at the statewide level. Thanks, Amber. Unmuted. Hey, everyone. And it's always Amber Rose, never Amber. There's Amber. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, thank you all for being on. Thanks for taking time out to join us on this call and get involved um, Hear what's happening around the country. Um, CURB, I think, uh, is really focused on lifting up people who are incarcerated on life without parole in this moment. 
Um, you know, there's lots of demands going around to release people who are medically vulnerable, people who are elders. And I think um, what people forget to remember is that people who are locked up on life without parole sentencing are ineligible for elder parole. They're ineligible for compassionate release when terminally ill and aging. And so I think in this moment, our goal is in partnership with CCWP, um, here in California is to lift up people who are on life without parole, um, targeting the governor's office and his administration to really use that clemency power um, to grant commutations. There are hundreds of commutation packages sitting on the governor's desk right now um, that have not been answered. And in the wake of this crisis, I think it's most important for the governor to grant those clemencies or to grant those commutations. Um, I think also it's important to recognize that our um, you know, our elder parole requirements are kind of ridiculous and they exclude way too many people who are incarcerated right now. Um, we're focusing on lifting up um, and, and really uh, advocating to the legislature um, to put forward legislation this year that would um, modify the requirements for elder parole to change the age requirement from 60 years old to 50 years old and also to change the uh, requirement for time served from 25 years to 15 years. Um, we have an elder parole memo that has been circulated that's also been shared on the thread here um, that explains why those recommendations fit and why they're necessary. Um, and so please, you know, share that around, educate folks and help us advocate to the legislature specifically to people on um, the budget committees for public safety. Um, I think those are the folks who can help us move this as quickly as possible. Um, but I think it's really important that CURB continue to lift that up with California um, Coalition for Women Prisoners because uh, that's kind of the population that's always been left out, right? And, and I think, I think we, we all kind of know that. Um, and I think, you know, we're also really excited um, to be partnering with people on, on a national scale, um, creating that national solidarity with Clemency Coast to Coast. Um, with RAP campaign, Laura's here and you'll hear from Laura in a bit uh, to talk about the work that RAP's doing. But RAP, um, uh, the Parole Preparation Project, CCWP and CURB um, recently partnered. We did like a Twitter storm, which I think was kind of effective, um, really calling out clemency coast to coast, wanting, of course, governors uh, Cuomo and Newsom to grant clemencies. We're going to open that up, um, you know, moving forward so that it's uh, building in people from other states as well, calling on their governors to grant clemencies um, in this crisis and forward, right? Um, and so, you know, keep an eye out for that. I think since then, we, like the day that we did that campaign, which I'd like to think our pressure helped <laughs> Governor Newsom go ahead and sign some of those commutations. Um, thousands of people joined. I'm sure that he heard from us, but anyhow, um, you know, calling the governor's office and, and, and really doing outreach on social media and in traditional media. I think um, Governor Newsom granted 21 commutations, nine of which were life without parole. Um, the other 12 or 13 were uh, life sentences. And so, um, but that's not enough, right? When we have over 5,000 people on life without parole sentencing in California, that's not enough. And so I think um, for here on, we will continue to pressure. What we do know is that uh, the governor is being sort of, um, uh, he's getting a lot of pushback, I think, from people who are victims' rights advocates. And so I think our job now forward is uh, to get support from groups who are survivors and, and victims' right, rights groups who are in alignment with our goal to end the incarceration crisis, right? Like, that is key right now in helping us push forward commutations in the state of California and I think anywhere else. But um, we know that that's key right now. Um, I do want to touch a little bit on, uh, you know, CCWP and the work that's happening inside, actually, which is super, super important. Um, you know, constant communication with people inside is super important right now. People are terrified and people are worried as they should be, right? It's warranted. And so constant communication, um, making sure that we're connecting with people, um, we're connecting people inside with reporters and journalists so that their voices can be lifted up and their stories are heard, um, so that people get a real scope of what it looks like to be incarcerated right now under this pandemic. Um, so that's really important. CCWP is also supporting people with money. People need money on their books so that they can have um, money for phone calls, so they can have money for letters and stamps and paper, and so that they can get, um, you know, stay in communication with their families and their loved ones, um, but also stay in communications with advocates on the outside who are doing the work so that we are in partnership with them as we're moving these things forward, so that we're centering their voices. Um, also, I think is important uh, to realize that even, even as we are helping 
them with resources so that they can make phone calls. Phone calls are freaking limited right now, um, you know, it, because of the uh, ridiculous kind of um, we're, we're, we're going to practice social dis distancing in prisons, right? So people are actually being limited on the number of phone calls that they can make, um, which is terrible. Um, and so, you know, not only are folks sitting in a Petri dish for this, for this virus, um, they're also being cut off from communication with folks. So it's important right now to stay in contact with folks and to help figure out ways to keep folks connected to community out here on the outside. Um, I think what's also important is um, the mutual aid work that CCWP is doing, just making sure that people not only have money so that they can stay connected, but like making sure people get supplies, you know, making sure that people have what, you know, even though supplies are limited and the type of supplies that are able, that, that people are able to have access to inside, it's important to make sure that people have resources so that they can have um, some of those supplies. And then I think also, you know, the work in connecting with the wardens. CCWP is, is connected with the wardens in the two women's prisons here in the state of California. Um, you know, really demanding that people have access to things that can help them in this situation, like soap, right? Uh, to wash their hands, um, making sure that people um, are able to do the things that any individual can do in that situation um, to protect themselves, which is not much, but, but we do need to consider what people are going through inside. Um, and so that, I think that's, that's a huge demand. Um, and then also just demanding that not only are cleaning supplies distributed, but that they're maintained. And I think that that's obviously a problem right now in prisons. Um, they'll hand out a few supplies to a few folks and then it stops. And so, um, you know, it's important that we demand that people have access to cleaning supplies um, and things that'll, that can help them, um, you know, as they, you know, inevitably will come in contact with this, with this virus. Um, so, you know, I think also what's important to realize is that, um, you know, we, we did get 21 commutations, but the reality is uh, the governor's moving very slow. Um, and we can assume that not many people are going to be released right now. And so I think that should put, um, you know, fire under our asses <laughs> as advocates um, and as, you know, organizers um, to turn up the pressure. Um, in any way that we can, even though I know we're all quarantined, we have to turn up the pressure because people will die. Um, and I think also we have to pay attention to the fact that one of the things that the state is doing, that the CDC is doing, is not accepting um, people in state prisons right now. So people are like, jails definitely are being overcrowded because they're not sending people to prison and they're continuing to accept people inside of jails. And so um, the work spills over, right? We're, we're definitely um, centering what's happening in prisons, but it's spilling over as di as happened with sort of realignment in 2011 when they shifted all these people from prison to, to jails, right? And so, um, so I think we have to figure out ways to coordinate the work that's happening with jails and with prisons. Um, and I think it's really important to focus on people who are most vulnerable, which is people on LWAP, you know, seeing as they have the least access to any kind of care right now. Um, and so, so that's the work that Curb is, is doing in partnership, of course, with um, California Coalition for Wh Women Prisoners and the Drop OWAP campaign, um, you know, and everyone else who's, who's really concerned about folks in this moment. Um, and building here forward, you know, making sure that people understand, I think, the bigger picture, uh, incarceration is a crisis outside of COVID-19. When COVID-19 is over, uh, then, you know, it's still a crisis. And so I think um, our job is to continue to help lift up that, um, the bigger narrative, um, and bringing people in from all different kinds of social justice uh, realm. So, you know, environmental justice, health justice, um, all kinds of areas to help make sure people stay connected to this work. So much, Amber Rose. Next, we have Laura Whitehearn, who'll be speaking about releasing aging um, prisoners. And we just wanted to also name that somebody has requested that folks speak about releasing federal prisoners as well. Um, so if that is something you could speak on, Laura, that would be great. So again, Laura Whitehearn with releasing, releasing aging people in prison. Hi, it's Release Aging People in Prison. We have a very clunky name, so it's hard to remember. Um, I'm sorry, I was late to this call and I'm have, gonna have to get off early because New York being the epicenter of this pandemic right now, we just got reliable word from Sing Sing this morning that um, a man who was exhibiting uh, symptoms of COVID-19 died. And, um, I just want to say, you know, in terms of context, I'm really glad, Laura, that you mentioned Palestine. 
because uh, I have a problem with all of us sometimes that we kind of focus in on prisons, don't look at the whole structure of the United States policing and state violence, and then don't look at the world. So, you know, that's important to keep in mind at this point. Um, people may know RAP is uh, founded and led by formerly incarcerated people, um, some of us old, <laughs> some not quite so old. And we've been fighting for, we chose to focus on elders because that in New York State is the population of people who are the most, um, had the longest sentences for violent crimes. And we started rap at a point when everyone across the country was talking about low level, nonviolent, you know, let them out. And in New York, they did that. They, they uh, reformed the Rockefeller drug laws. And so the population went down by 30% and the uh, elder population doubled in that time. And the reason I'm saying it now is not because, you know, people need to understand that, you all know that, but because um, in this moment we're seeing again uh, that, and I, I felt like, you know, maybe we had begun to win this <laughs> nationally, that you can't talk about abolition, certainly. You can't even talk about prison reform if you only talk about what Fareed, our founder who died two years ago, is to call the low-hanging fruit. Um, and that's happening now again. And so one of the things that we are trying to emphasize is that public health uh, criteria should be used, not criminal justice criteria to decide when people are getting out. So in other words, it doesn't matter. You killed the cop in 1971 and now you're 68. What matters is that you have a stable place to go to or one's being provided and that you are vulnerable to the virus. Same thing is true of younger people, of trans. We're fighting very hard for the release of trans people from, from the state system because they're vulnerable. People with HIV, AIDS, people with all of those vulnerabilities. We have, we do everything everyone has mentioned, you know, public social media campaigns, success like 12 percent of um, people in New York City jails have now been released but you know when he was talking about it the mayor was saying he was going to confer with the NYPD about releases so that's what I mean by we have to push this is public health since so you don't you know the Blasio's kid is sick he doesn't call the fucking cops to ask them what he should do he calls the doctor so um, we want to use that framework. We have so many public health experts who are saying, and I think this is our overall message, there is no way that jails and prisons can protect people, treat people, keep people alive, keep people from acquiring this virus. It's the opposite. It's like, what do they call them? You know, it's a wildfire. It's a, it's a petri dish for how to spread um, a virus like this. So RAP and our many partners from the people we're pushing back against the attempts to undo bail reform, I mean, how idiotic is that in this period? We're pushing back against the attempts to define people by their crime category. And um, I want people, if you can, I will send as soon as it's up the tape of a press conference that's really, press conference is the wrong word. It was really like a community speak out that we just hosted that had like 200 people participating, but the speakers were family members um, because we've been hearing from inside the stories of what's going on and the fear. And I was in prison during the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. I was in DC jail and Baltimore City jail. You can imagine, you know, no one was even saying women get AIDS yet and my friends were dying. And I remember that um, the issue was to have some control over information and over methods of protection and all of that. And it's the opposite of what's happening now inside the prisons. So we are, our main demand is of the governor because he is in and just a side note we should the this virus has exposed every racist shred in this society but in the prisons in new york state a neoliberal state you can see how these unbelievable byzantine methods of release make it so hard to get someone out in 
in you know less than eight months before they'll be they'll be dead. So we should look at that afterwards too. But anyway, the governor is the only one with the power to do it like that. I'm personally, I, we have a clemency campaign. Amber Rose, it was I don't know if you're on again. It was so great to so great to be working with the people in California. Um, we're working against death by incarceration altogether, against life sentences. But um, I'm not a big fan of only focusing on clemency because that means that we're, give, we're recognizing and embracing the power of the governor. That is not what we want. We want communities, you know, we want an end to state violence. We want an end to policing, an end to prisons, not to have some, you know, big wig at the top. Um, however, in this moment, that is the, the fastest way. We are also pressuring the parole board, which has been acting really strange in the last weeks. We've been hearing things about hearings being put off, um, but we're pressuring the parole board to do what they can. We're pressuring on, uh, we're not pushing the legislature right now because we're, it's a little in the weeds, but in New York, the budget's being decided and we don't want them absent the power of the advocates and the community to be deciding how to pass legislation because we know that if they do, most of them will do it and um, exclude people convicted of certain uh, offenses. So those are the things we're doing. We're working with everyone we can. We had, you know, you'll see if you look at the press conference, it had like 20 different uh, organizations sponsoring it. Um, we're insisting that the voices of currently incarcerated, formerly incarcerated people and families be heard, not just for a principle, though I do have one, that the you know, people who were damaged and are damaged by this um, should be the people whose voices are heard, but also because we're the experts on what's going on, on how people should be released, on why they they can't deal with this inside and also on what they should be doing inside for example uh i think amber rose talked about phone calls they're really important but can you imagine i mean andrea you remember this when you're in the in the fucking prison you're picking up a phone that someone else has been sneezing coughing at home and how do you how do you protect anything so we do have a set of demands which i will send um i would really ask people to watch at least parts of the press conference um, I think Andrea can probably talk more about the feds, but we are, we just initiated, for example, a move to uh, have them release all the, what are called old law prisoners in the federal system, which are 236, I think, people who actually are eligible for parole in a system that did away with parole in 1987. They all have been heard many times at the board. They could be released overnight on paper. So um, there, I think everyone is pushing in the same direction. Just before I end, I just want to say one last thing besides let's look at the public health criteria. If you go on RAP's press page, there's a million um, uh, stories from the media. We have used the media a lot because they're hungry for stories about the virus. So, you know, we gave it to them and we've gotten a lot of media. Um, there's an op-ed in t probably in tomorrow's times uh, calling on the governor to release people. Um, and we're about to issue a, a letter signed by, I think, 250 public health experts. We need in this moment to recognize that the virus is moving faster than we can. And it's certainly moving faster than the fucking system can. And we all need to pull together to insist on no exclusions, that we will never get anywhere if we allow them to use this moment to go back to um, the same things that built the massive criminalization that exists now. So um, I think my time is up, especially since we had that little break. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to send those two things. And I would really ask people also to that we all, you know, respond to each other's uh, social uh, media campaigns and stuff, sign on to each other's letters pull together and uh, fight like hell because if we don't, mm, it's going to be a very bad situation. And if we do, because this is a moment of crisis, we could come out with something better. In a moment like this where this tremendous disaster, either 
the ruling class, the police, they all get stronger and stronger, the corporations, or there's room for, dare I say, revolutionary justice to be talked about. So release them all, let them go. Clemency coast to coast, release coast to coast, just let them the fuck out so they can live. Thank you so much, Laura, with release aging people in prison and for those hopeful words that we all need right now as well. And also providing us the framework of a health, public health lens rather than a criminal justice lens in this moment in terms of how we approach this. Um, and everyone, thanks for bearing with us as we gave you a little stretch break, which I'm sure you all appreciate it. Um, so we are now back and next we have Andrea James, who's going to be speaking on behalf of the National Council for Incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women and girls. Thanks so much, Andrea. Hey, thank you. <laughs> thanks everybody. And uh, thank you, Laura. Um, as Laura stated uh, at the National Council, we are also all incarcerated or formerly incarcerated women and girls. Family members, our name speaks for themselves. And I, um, pretty much our organization is national in name only really. We're a beautiful, collective of women and girls, LGBTQ, gender non-conforming, unapologetically from a gender uh, analysis of working on um, these issues. And uh, because of that, um, our membership and all of us are, are doing national work, yes, but we are uh, sharing the hyper-local work that uh, makes up the entire work of the National Council. And so we are all uh, women who are deeply connected to our local neighborhoods in the work that's happening on the ground in our local communities. So for instance, um, we've got a whole list of women who are formerly incarcerated, women and girls, such as Families for Justice is Healing, Change Comes Now. I mean, we could go on and on listing um, Women Against Mass Incarceration, Women's Justice and Freedom Initiative, all of these sisters that are in their hyper-local hyper neighborhoods who are um, doing this work and, and sharing and intentionally coming together to share out um, their strategies and their campaigns, particularly important in a time like this with COVID-19. And so we're national, yes, but only in the sense that we are all intentional about being together and sharing our ideas and our resources. And so I really want to, all the things that people have mentioned, and thank you everybody for all of this incredible work that we're hearing about. Um, we're getting, you know, we, we uh, everything that we do is connected to women, state, county, and federal women inside of prisons across the country. And so we already every day speak to our sisters inside. Our community is not seg separated. It includes our sisters inside. Every single project and initiative we work on includes women inside who are working on those projects along with us. And so we already get that information funneling into us on a regular and consistent basis. The Terra uh, that we're hearing now. Um, right before we got on this call, we were on a prison call and we were with one of our sisters who's ho home now, but literally broke down in tears, asking why everybody else in the country doesn't see things the way that we do. And that speaks volumes. And so these sisters um, in our collective are on the ground in their hyper-local communities, doing everything that everybody has mentioned on these calls of all the valiant and beautiful work. Um, one of the things that uh, we are doing though, I wanna speak to the federal level because many people have asked for that information. Um, on the federal level, we have, uh, we are part of the Justice Roundtable. We have been for many years now. We do do federal work. Many of us who were the founders of the National Council came from the federal prison system. And so we um, have always included that work. And so we worked very hard on what turned out to come out in the Ba um, memo um, that the um, uh, specifically spoke to conditions of confinement and pushing out as many people as possible. We don't use carve outs. Um, so it makes, us diff it makes it difficult for us, but we have been using our movement lawyers and our voices to respond in, in people letters, in directly affected people letters, um, to say um, these carve outs aren't acceptable and that we need to release pe all the people. We've been pushing for clemency, we've been pushing for the existing federal policies, such as compassionate release, um, such as home confinement, 
on the federal level um, and everything in the kitchen sink that we can throw um, to also using our movement lawyers to file motions. We're flooded by phone calls of women still. The United States Marshals are um, insisting that people who have self-surrender dates, if you are eligible for a self-surrender in the federal prison uh, system, you should not be going into a prison. Self-surrender is the lowest level of entry into the federal prison system. Um, they are the least classified security level and still the U.S. Marshals in this country are insisting that people with self-surrender still turn themselves into a county jail to wait for a U.S. Marshal to pick them up. It's absolutely insane. And so we have been inundated with these requests and keeping up with them to file the motions and get our uh, movement lawyers to try and help uh, keep people from having to go in based on the self-surrender. We've organized the formerly incarcerated people statement with formerly incarcerated people around the country. We had over 510 individual signatures from formerly incarcerated people around the country. We felt that as formerly incarcerated folk, as Laura has mentioned, we are the experts and we needed to have just our own voices heard in a statement directly from us. In addition, we worked with members of Congress, Ayanna Presley, uh, Congresswoman Bass, to also uh, send to congressional leadership a statement from formerly incarcerated people to make sure that our voices were being heard, whether they were listening or not, we had to make the demand. We know though uh, that, that uh, because of that, some of our uh, ask are being, uh, answered. And again, continuing the work as far as the Justice Roundtable. But I just wanted to, to just end up, uh, I know a lot of things have been said, pretty much everything on the local level we're, we're doing in our local organizing spaces and amongst our coalitions um, that make up hundreds of formerly incarcerated women around the country. But one thing that I want to really point out, one of the things that we just kind of put up, just stopped, um, we are going to fight we get these calls every day. It has completely been triggering for our staff who are all formerly incarcerated women around the country. Most of us receive phone calls from the women that we left behind. We know these women personally. It has been completely triggering on behalf of our staff and our collective to receive these phone calls where our folks on the outside are completely just torn to pieces around trying to find ways to get the word inside to our sisters and our brothers that we are out here and we're fighting on behalf of them um, and trying to create platforms for their voices to be heard directly. And I'll just end with saying that um, we decided at the National Council that we were just going to pull back and just continue our abolition work. Laura said it all. Uh, we're not going to be derailed. Uh, the pandemic is incarceration. We need to keep that at the forefront. And we need to remember that the work that we're all doing needs to be centered deeply in our hyperlocal communities. And this virus has exposed for everybody else who didn't know, now you know, all of the inequities and the, and the, and the um, things that don't work with systems, not just the criminal legal system, but systems across the board that are set up to, to do nothing on behalf of cash poor, working poor, the poor, incarcerated, formerly incarcerated folk. So I wanna encourage us all, now is the time to get deep into your local neighborhood and begin to have that conversation around what does participatory budgeting look like? What does participatory defense look like? What does transformative justice look like? What are these local systems look like to stop the flow of our people locally into jails and prisons and to help locally to pull our people outside? So I wanna encourage everybody, take this opportunity um, this pandemic that we describe not as COVID, but as incarceration and get locally and figure out how are we going to use all of the stuff that has been laid bare about how horrible these systems are to begin to create those hyper-local systems that we can then begin to stitch together community by community to really create some transformation amongst and on behalf of our people. So thank you.
Thank you so much, Andrea, and for really lifting up the ways in which the contradiction between people's health and well-being and policing and criminalization and imprisonment um, has really impacted our communities. Next, we're going to um, move right into that concept, the concept of decriminalization, jails, and policing. We're going to hear from Anna So and Rory Elliott with Critical Resistance Portland and the Care Not Cops campaign. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm Anna with Care Not Cops and Critical Resistance. Um, so a little bit about Care Not Cops. Um, Care Not Cops is an anti-policing campaign in Portland, and our goal is to abolish the gun violence reduction team, which is the gang policing unit of the Portland Police Bureau. So we push for the city to divest from the gun violence reduction team and invest those funds into community resources, um, self-determined resources instead. Um, and in this moment, our demands are focused on decarceration, housing, and opposing criminalization around COVID-19, particularly with the stay-at-home order, which is similar to shelter-in-place. Um, and we also specifically name the impacts of policing um, for youth perceived by police as gang-affiliated, um, since schools are closed now, um, and also for Black and Brown Portlanders who are targeted by the gun violence reduction team and the broader police bureau. So right now we'd normally be mobilizing to city council meetings and elected officials offices to put pressure on them. But since we aren't right now able to meet or gather in person, um, we've kind of been trying to um, organize virtually and through the internet um, and through social media. Um, so I'm going to pass it on to Rory to talk about our strategies and tactics now. Hey, um, my name is Rory. Um, yeah, so some of our strategies and tactics have been similar to what people um, have been voicing. Um, so we drafted a letter with about 13 anti-policing and decarceration focused demands and recommendations. Um, and initially when we sent it out, we solicited 20, around 20 sign-ons and that number has grown exponentially um, from a diverse range of community organizations in Portland. Um, and we sent this letter to decision makers on all levels from city, county, um, to state. Um, so to build pressure, uh, we started a phones app last week through social media and our listserv um, email, where we asked supporters to make phone calls and emails that targeted a different decision maker each day. So like from city council to the county commissioners, the sheriff's office the mayor and the governor. <clears throat> um, and uh, to keep that going and that support going and like really do some political education around our demands, um, we are holding a social media political education series um, that each day focuses on like a bucket of, um, of our demands and really like elaborates the one, the utility of them and how they interconnect with each other and how they uplift an abolitionist lens. Um, so like tying decarceration and anti-policing into areas of housing, healthcare, and employment rights um, to really like broadly like contextualize this moment for uh, everyone who's, who's out there. So um, Anna's going to talk about the impact of what we've done so far and what's going on in Portland. Yeah, so in response to um, the statement of our demands, um, we've received a letter from the county chair letting us know that the county has reduced the jail population by 30% um, and that all law enforcement in the county are now citing people to appear in court at a later date and releasing them instead of booking them for all misdemeanor charges, I think with a few exceptions. And then uh, they are identifying and releasing people with 14 days or less left of their sentence. Um, and they've also placed a moratorium on the payment of all supervision fees for folks on parole and probation. Um, so with these, um, uh, these responses, like there was already some momentum around these demands um, that decision makers were moving on. Um, and we see this moment as um, having a really strong potential and an opportunity to keep pushing them further towards abolitionist steps for decarceration. Um, because even with, even with these responses, um, there are all these conditions and people should be released without these conditions. 
Um, and so the current release is happening does set a precedent though for the future to release people in as significant numbers as possible. And it really shows that no one should be imprisoned um, and, there, and that social distancing is impossible also in prisons right now. So, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, those, that, that concludes the section on presentations from awesome organizers and activists on this webinar. We wanted to open it up for questions because of the technical glitch, we're a little short on time. Um, so I know that many of you have been chatting your questions in the chat box. We're gonna encourage you to continue to do that. Um, and our panelists will engage with you there. In addition, the questions that you are posing will help inform the, the upcoming series of webinars that Critical Resistance will be taking up. So please do share any thoughts and reflections you have and continue to put out um, those questions that you have directed at particular panelists. I wanted to close it out with one um, last question for, for all our panelists on the question of militarization. Um, I know that Amber, um, Human Impact Partners put out a statement um, cautioning against the use of militarized force to enforce shelter in place orders across different states. And I imagine all of you have been thinking about that as we anticipate um, how is it that we're going to resist the increase um, in the intensity of policing and militarization of policing as cities attempt to enforce the shelter in place order, including preparing ourselves to, prepare, um, to support those on the inside with the concern of um, locking down of prison. So um, if people can please just share some final thoughts on how we can um, learn from past crisis um, and past resistance, for example, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans to help inform our work, what are some lessons we can draw in this moment? And, and generally speaking, how are you all thinking about the, um, the issue of militarization and the fear of that sort of impeding and coming into our local municipalities, but also broadly speaking across the country? And we can start with Amber, and if anyone else wants to chime in, please do. Sure, thanks, Lara. Um, yeah, as Lara mentioned, um, we put out a sign-on letter um, basically asserting that we need public health responses, we need public health infrastructure to respond to this crisis. Um, further militarization is just going to further harm our health. You know, policing as well as incarceration are harmful to our health. That did not start with COVID-19 and it will not end with the end of this pandemic. And so, you know, while we recognize that this country and local and state government have invested in that type of infrastructure, in the infrastructure that controls and harms our community, it is not a public health infrastructure. Um, military will never be a public health organization. And while we need to make sure we're meeting the immediate needs of people, this is actually precisely the moment that we need to be shoring up um, community-led work that really advances what we care about. Yeah, I'm sorry, Larry, for breaking in, but I gotta get off. So can I just say something really quick? Totally agree with that. And also, um, we know that the powers, the cops, what are, the uh, governors are gonna do what they're gonna do. We are opposed to, temp to uh, house arrest. We're opposed to furloughs. We're opposed to anything that is going to, you know, it's these neoliberal solutions that we're gonna end up like, like LWAP. LWAP came out of ending the death penalty, right? So we are trying really hard to stand firm and also for RAP, and maybe it's because we're like a small community-based organization and um, not connected to an institution or something, but you know, it's community power that is going to win or lose this battle. So um, the organizing, and it's hard when you're, you can't be out there talking to people. Um, but we're really trying very hard to do that. And I think it's really critical. Amber Rose talked before about hooking up with the, not hooking up, but connecting with the victim's rights community, which we've tried to do. And we've had some limited success with that in New York. You know, okay, I wouldn't say limited, but some success. Um, we also, and we work with all the, the groups that do work on policing, but we haven't been able to bring together one, like, mm, that would be, a major event or something, and this might be the moment. So, you know, just again, it's really hard because we know that, you know, if you're, if you're in prison, you'd rather, I would have been, if they had said to me, okay, you can have an ankle bracelet if you go out, I probably would have said yes. But for us, we can hold firm and, you know, fine, if they're gonna do that, they're gonna do it. We, we're not gonna be able to stop it, but 
um, I feel really strongly that our voice has to be, we have to continue with our maximal demands and we can't accept, yeah, we'll let out. I mean, knew some 21 people, you know, and we were kind of excited by that, right? Amber Rose, because we felt like, oh, it's, a, and then we said 21 people, that's ridiculous. So anyway, thanks for doing this call. I'm really sorry to be in and out, but you know, I'm sure everyone else has a lot of work to do too. I'm really sorry, okay. Thanks so much, Laura. Do folks have other thoughts they would like to um, close out with, either in relationship to the militarization question or broadly speaking? Just broadly speaking, just something real quick is that the policies that we're developing now or that are coming out now on like reactions from the system can either be very good or very bad and set us up in the long term. We have to think about how we're, we can't, like for example, the 48 hours to the seven days, we can't let that become status quo in the future. And so I'm hoping that we can also think long term, like how are the policies and that we're setting up now going to impact us in the future? And, you know, let's not leave anybody behind. Let's not give more money to the system. And let's not build something that we'll have to destroy in the future. I have, uh, thank you, Anissa. I have one thing to add too, just, um, you know, uh, in, in relationship to the conversation about victims and victims rights group and survivors. I think um, part of that is yes, we need to be connecting and building and coordinating with groups uh, who are in alignment with our values. But also I think what we need to do is be lifting up the fact that shit, most incarcerated people, 99% of the incarcerated, 100% of incarcerated people have also survived violence. Right, and lifting up the fact that they have also been victims of, of violence, either state violence, intercommunal violence, but really lifting that up and bringing it back to the root of the problem, which is like the, the entire system, right? So I think, um, yes, we have to talk with folks who are like outside of our organizing, but are sort of in alignment, but also lifting up the fact that we are incarcerating people who have survived violence. And I think, um, you know, in, you know, thinking of Newsom and kind of how he's like, we're getting blowback, I think reminding him that the people that we're actually talking about holding in cages are those people, are those victims, are those survivors is really important at this moment too. Um, and totally agree with everything Laura said about really holding true to, uh, you know, our demands and, and making sure that we're not allowing this pandemic to redirect um, what we're actually fighting for um, and agreeing with Evans that we can't, we can't let things that are coming forward now, um, you know, uh, set us back or leave us um, in a position where we're going to have to try and tear those policies and procedures down moving forward. Yeah, um, and this is Kyle. I also just wanted to add, um, since I also work at an anti-violence organization, um, like just noting and like naming the fact that like domestic violence has been increasing, especially like within California with like the shelter in place um, that has been happening. And so like, yes, the definitely like a need for us to like talk to more anti-violence like organizations is absolutely crucial and necessary but also in figuring out um how to be really intentional with like language because i know that within our like within the da within um san francisco like that's been one of the things that he's been particularly worried about is like um the increase in domestic violence and like how that's actually gonna is gonna lead into having even more folks incarcerated um and so like really making sure that we're like doing that political education and like bringing the folks that are in the anti-violence movement over um, to shift a bit more politically and like t like flipping that framework as you all had mentioned of um, thinking about victimhood as you know this like white woman who is experiencing violence and being like actually we all have experienced violence um, and all of us actually deserve um, to live outside of these cages. Thanks so much for that and, um, and everyone for the reminder that we should be setting the ceiling right now in, in order to advance our movements. This is an opportunity in many ways and that we should seize on this opportunity for the sake of the well-being of all our communities. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Mohammed from Critical Resistance to do a quick announcement. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, I want to just thank everyone, um, really, um, for being part of this. This is, has been really um uh inspiring to hear from all you amazing speakers and the work that all of the organizations and the coalitions that you're all a part of and um all that's happening um so as part of our efforts to continue pushing abolition in this moment um we are 
working on an abolitionist platform in response to COVID-19, and we'll be aiming to release it later this week alongside some of our national partners. Um, as many people have noted, the situation calls on us to be bold and creative in our organizing and, and, and our demands to connect the, the movement to abolish the PIC to uh, all our movements for, for resources and for freedom. Um, so be on the lookout. Uh, subscribe to our mailing list if you're not, um, and we'll be sending out an email um, to follow up. Thank you, and thank you to all the wonderful panelists for sharing your wisdom and insight and awesome organizing efforts. I hope it was an opportunity for you to learn from each other and also for those who are listening in to learn about some great tactics and strategies that are being employed and to help inform each other in our work in these coming days. We saw great questions being posted around specific strategies of targets, petitions, how are we, how is, um, how are we being impactful in all of that? And I think we will continue to be um, in conversation with you. I know Critical Resistance is planning on another webinar and also um, all the resources that were shared will be shared over email if you registered for this webinar. And please do donate and support the campaign, sign on to their petitions and letters and pay attention to those resources because as you can see, a lot of work goes into it, a lot of love goes into it it and it's only impactful if we all come and go into this together to support each other and lift up each other's organizing efforts. Um, much love and solidarity to you all and stay healthy and we look forward to continue to do this really important work together. And thank you to Critical Resistance for putting this on and inviting me to moderate. Thank you everybody. Thank you all. Fantastic. Thank you. Peace. Bye.